STS-1. Veteran astronaut John Young, one of the 12 men to set foot on the moon, is in command. His pilot is first-time flyer Bob Crippen. To be sitting on board up there with my buddy John Young uh, and get to experience the whole thing from ascent to being on orbit to flying re-entry, uh, it uh, was one of the high points of my career. Together they would travel over a million miles and circle the Earth 36 times. The launch finally occurred. We'd been waiting and postponing and postponing and, and uh, when it finally lifted off and we knew it was going and, and achieved orbit, uh, we were all in anxious anticipation for what was going to happen next. Launched like a rocket two days earlier, Columbia lands as a glider on the dry lake bed of Edwards Air Force Base in California. Watching out, out the window, uh, watching the sea and the clouds rush by, it actually gave a, a sense of speed, more so than, um, uh, than when we were up in orbit, uh, being much higher. Uh, I think they were all very relieved because there had been some concern because we had lost some tiles initially on, on the orbit and they didn't know whether we'd lost any on the bottom or not. Flew down over the San Joaquin Valley. We do a big turnaround to land on the, on the lake bed for that first flight. And I remember when John went into a bank, a big left bank, I looked down at the lake bed and there's thousands of people out there. <laughs> and John, look at all those folks, uh, which had come out to see us land. Joe Engel was chased, and hear his voice coming in on final, uh, talking to John Young and, and Crip in, in the airplane that they were right on glide slope, coming in for a landing, and then have that landing, and then have John Young do his Young dance. He, he was just so elated uh, it was such a magnificent flying machine uh, to him at that time. The first time I really saw a real shuttle was the uh, Columbia when it was out on the lake bed after the landing and I'm walking around it. I couldn't believe they sent that big a mass up in the air. People really thought this was all impossible. So what we do, what we have done and shown and demonstrated through the shuttle program is we've shown that we can take the impossible and make it possible. Thousands of spectators line up along the landing strip to greet the shuttle and its two-man crew. Anyone who was associated with the program or there just to see the shuttle return, I think felt a lot of pride in our country and our space program. And so uh, that, those emotions were, you know, finally released and you said, wow, you know, the flight was uh, done safely, they're back home. Uh, the, the shuttle really does work. It's a great program. It's got a great future ahead of it. Hey, this thing works. <laughs> and, uh, and we got it back all in one piece, which is what we wanted to do. While Columbia's return was spectacular, it would renew NASA engineers' worries about the shuttle's thermal protection system. During the post-landing inspection, 148 of the orbiter's tiles were found shattered, and 16 more were missing due to the effects of an overpressure wave. While that and other issues were addressed, the 50-ton Columbia would be placed atop the specially configured 747 and ferried back to Florida and processing for its next mission. It's a massive enterprise. It's over eight stories tall uh, sitting on the ground and uh, it's, you never get over that site. It's really awesome. After the shuttle lands, there's a processing procedure for the shuttle. Post-flighting it, uh, checking the tires, checking the struts, uh, measure, get the right, correct measurements. And then uh, when the shuttle is ready to uh, uh, mate with, with the 747, we would tow underneath and then they would lower the, the space shuttle down on the supports on top of the aircraft we would take off. <laughs> On takeoffs from the extra long runways of Edwards Air Force Base. The shuttle carrier aircraft's crew of four would soon grow accustomed to the smell of burning rubber 
That's the intense heat generated by their plane spinning tires as they carry two massive aircraft at more than 100 miles an hour. The average range of a 747 is about 5,000 miles, but due to its weight, configuration, and special flight requirements, the SCA can travel only 1,000 miles at a time. A full turn in the jet can take several zip codes. 3, 2, Cruising at more than 250 miles per hour, the jumbo jet burns 40,000 pounds of fuel per hour. That's 130 pounds per mile, or the length of a football field per gallon. No wonder it has to make several stops before reaching Florida's east coast. We would get a spacecraft back, go over it again, be sure that we could reuse it, repair it where we had to do it. Had never been, never been done before. And so I think that's one of the marvelous things about the space shuttle was we found a way to, to turn this spacecraft around and use it again. Before the end of 1982, Columbia would fly four more missions. Lift off of America's space shuttle. Including STS-5, the first with a crew of more than two astronauts. Challenger, the second orbiter in the shuttle fleet, made her maiden flight on April 4th, 1983. And liftoff, liftoff of the orbiter Challenger and the sixth flight of the space shuttle. STS-6 deployed a communications satellite and featured the first spacewalk of the shuttle era. Just two months later, shuttle Challenger was back in orbit, this time with the first American woman in space. Physicist Dr. Sally Ride was a member of Commander Bob Crippen's STS-7 group that deployed Canadian and Indonesian satellites during the six-day mission. Challenger was ready for flight in less than two months, another NASA first. Shuttling the first African-American to space, an Air Force combat pilot, Guy Bluford. For me, it was an exciting moment because it was something that I had been training for for 15 to 16 months, and so I was looking forward to the experience of flying in space. We are in an era of brotherhood. Yeah, lift off, lift off of Mission 41D, the first flight of the orbiter Discovery. In 1984 to 86, the newest orbiter, Discovery, would fly a record six missions. And liftoff, liftoff of mission 51D and the seven-member crew of Discovery. Carrying into space satellites, international astronauts, even a U.S. senator and a congressman. One year after Discovery's debut, Atlantis flew her first mission. Liftoff, liftoff of Atlantis. A new orbiter joins the shuttle fleet and it has cleared the tower. SDS 51J. It was also one of seven classified missions the space shuttle would fly for the Department of Defense. By the end of 1985, the space shuttle program had completed 23 missions, including nine that year alone. Each successful flight had the unattended consequence of convincing some that spaceflight, once considered among humankind's most inherently dangerous endeavors, had become routine. That notion would soon be tragically dispelled. Well, I am so excited to be here. Amid much fanfare, Krista McAuliffe, an elementary school instructor from Concord, New Hampshire, had been chosen from among 11,000 applicants to be NASA's first teacher in space. I would like to humanize the space age by giving a perspective from a non-astronaut because I think the students will look at that and say, this is an ordinary person. This ordinary person is contributing to history, and if they can make that connection, then they're going to get excited about history, they're going to get excited about the future, they're going to get excited about space. The American public's interest in its space program was renewed by her participation and was eager to see her off. Commanding the flight was Dick Scobie. His pilot was Michael Smith. Serving as Challenger's mission specialists are Judy Resnick, Ellison Onizuka, and Ron McNair, Joining McAuliffe as a payload specialist was Greg Jarvis. From the start, STS-51L was plagued by delays, mostly due to unseasonably cold temperatures in Florida. Rather than give pause for thought, the delays only tried the nation's patience. Everyone, it seemed, was itching to go. 
January 28th, the ground temperature at launch pad 39B was a frigid 36 degrees. Ice could be seen on the launch vehicle. Despite concerns voiced by some, shuttle managers reluctantly decided to press ahead for a late morning liftoff. Six, we have main engine start. Four, three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Challenger, go with throttle up. Challenger, go with throttle up. At 11.39 Eastern, twice the speed of sound, the Challenger's fuselage breaks apart from the inside out. America's space program suffers its first fatalities in flight. God, no! All seven Challenger crew members perish. Okay, everybody, stay off the telephones. Make sure you maintain all your data. Start pulling it together.